Hello, and welcome to this episode of the 5G Factor. I'm Shelley Kramer, and I'm joined today by my co-host and fellow analyst here at Futurum Research, Ron Westfall. And this show is intended to cover all things related to the 5G ecosystem, IoT, and all things in between. So with that, we're off. And hi, Ron. Great to see you today. Yes, indeed. It's a beautiful, sunny day. So looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. We're going to kick off today's show. We're going to talk about a little brouhaha between Elon Musk's Starlink and some of the headlines on this topic have been kind of interesting, but probably the most succinct of which is that, um, you know, Starlink is is turning on 5G. And by the way, this is not necessarily a new um, instance, but I think it's recent news during this last weekend. Um, we, we had uh, uh, about 70,000 Starlink customers um, or users or whatever, uh, fans, whatever we want to call them, um, protesting Dish Network's proposal to use the 12 gigahertz radio spectrum for a 5G cellular network. And Musk has made no bones about the fact that he believes that this interferes with Starlink's ability to be successful um, in serving its customers. And uh, SpaceX, uh, Musk's company, filed a petition claiming that the expanded 5G usage would lead to substantial interference for the company if they were forced to work along 5G. So... <laughs> I know, Rana, you have some thoughts on this, but it's interesting. So so anyway, these 70,000 Starlink users literally bombarded the FCC this last weekend with messages protesting Dish Network's plan, calling on the FCC to reject the company's proposed use of the 12 gigahertz radio spectrum. And um, Ron, I know you ran across this. What do you think? <laughs> Well, yeah, it's definitely a headline uh, news uh, for an otherwise somewhat slow July month. You call it Battle of the Billionaires, and there right, are studies. Right. Uh, obviously, Elon Musk uh, is a, a head of SpaceX, and they're the ones who are deploying the, the Starlink uh, network. Satellites, yeah. And, <laughs> right on. And uh, you have uh, Dish and other allies such as RS Access, uh, who are backed by Michael Dell. So right. this is, uh, I think, uh, makes it intriguing uh, from a, you know, a, a political perspective, uh, perhaps. Uh, but in terms of, you know, the, uh, the essence of what the dispute is about is that uh, Starlink is voicing its concern that if the 12 gigahertz band uh, specifically um, is used for terrestrial 5G, that will cause undue interference with its uh, efforts to use satellite connectivity right. Uh, right. to advance uh, internet connections uh, in rural areas, but also in some dense urban areas and so forth, wherever there's a need for uh, enhanced internet connectivity. And so uh, you have the battle of the studies uh, that is complementing this. Right. Uh, right. On the one hand, you have uh, Starlink's back study saying that within the 10.7 to 11.7 gigahertz uh, band, uh, that you have up to 880,000 fixed satellite links uh, that are uh, being uh, implemented uh, or allocated. Whereas uh, DISH is saying, well, that would be uh, way too many. Uh, that would uh, be definitely crowded for being able to support uh, this uh, spectrum for both terrestrial and satellite. It's actually only 69,000. Uh, fixed satellite uh, links that are being supported within the spectrum range. And the FCC database uh, it tends to favor what uh, you know, DISH is uh, allocating right. or uh, advocating. Right. And uh, so we shall see uh, you know, shall how see. this uh, will play out. Uh, we shall that's see. a pretty you know, big spread there, you know, 880,000 versus 69,000 people. Let's, you know, try to get a consensus here. It shouldn't be that hard right. to... Uh, you know, hammer this out and, you know, uh, proceed with using 12 gigahertz for all uh, customers out there. <laughs> well, I'm going to come down firmly on the side of DISH on this one. And I will also add that DISH is part of the 5G for 12 gigahertz coalition. And mm -hmm. there are a number of companies and organizations who belong to this coalition, um, 32 companies and organizations today. That number grows on a regular basis. Some of the organizations include Dell, VMware, Aliostar, um, Airspan, Mavenier, 
and things like the Center for Rural Technologies, the Open Technology Institute at New America, Federated Wireless, the Center for Educational Innovations, and the Rural Wireless Association. And so much of this conversation is around serving underserved areas, right? And rural areas. And it's, I mean, obviously SpaceX, Starlink, wants to be able to serve those communities. But the reality of it is what I look at when I see this coalition is formed, they've done lots of research, many, many organizations that we all know, many companies that we all know, and organizations specifically designed to serve these communities. Um, it's kind of a no brainer for me. I mean, this seems like a land grab, um, an air grab, a spectrum grab, whatever we want to call it. I'll leave um, it up. <laughs> but but you know, I, I ran across an Economic Times of India article on this topic, and they were a little bit harsher than some of the things that have been written here in the States. But they flat out called it an anti-5G narrative that Musk is running in the US and that is harmful for millions of customers who are looking for better connectivity and a chance to be able to use that connectivity to innovate and um and the 5G for 12 gigahertz coalition was quoted in that article as saying this tactic, it's a common one used by Musk, is not only disingenuous, it promulgates an anti-5G narrative. It's harmful to American consumers who deserve greater competition, connectivity options, and innovation. Again, it seemed, you know, the battle of the billionaires, I'm going to come down on <laughs> the side of dish on this one. So it'll be interesting to see what the FCC does for sure. Right on. <laughs> All right. So speaking of, let's see, we're going to talk a little bit about the ORAN Alliance and what's going on with ORAN Alliance efforts in the United States and how ATT and DISH and Cable Labs are leading those efforts. Share with us a little bit about some of what you know on that front, Ron. Yeah, it's it's an interesting combination. You don't uh, normally see cable labs in the same word yeah. as major operator, telco operators right. um, collaborating. Uh, but that is the case when it comes to open RAN testing. As we know, DISH is a greenfield network and they're very much strategically committed to open RAN. Right. And AT&T amongst the major telcos has been more proactive in supporting it, at least uh, rhetorically, uh, but they haven't actually done any deployments in their network uh, to date. Although it would seem uh, to stand a reason that they would probably be the first amongst the big three to actually get open ran out into uh, the field at uh, some point right. in the near future. Now, uh, Cable Labs, as uh, we know, has been set up by the cable industry uh, dating back to the 1980s to basically test technology for the cable industry to make sure that it's, you know, battle ready uh, for actual live deployments. And they've uh, been doing a good job of it uh, through the decades. And now they've been branching more into uh, 5G uh, connectivity and, and mobile uh, tech, uh, technology. In fact, the three of them conducted what they call a POC fest uh, across right. uh, four uh, different uh, test areas and are now uh, committed to opening what they're calling their open test and integration centers um, in uh, the Americas. And that will operate uh, the Curio uh, Cable Labs facility. And so right. pretty much Cable Labs is playing a central role here in terms of you know advancing open RAN cause, uh, which is something uh, that it doesn't seem that intuitive. You figured like the telcos would be right. uh, further along in this regard, uh, but uh, that is not the case here. And um, so uh, that is uh, also uh, coinciding with the fact that the ORAN Alliance uh, has also formed what it's called the Next Generations Research Group to focus on 6G uh, testing now. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Department of Defense is uh, funding what it's calling Resilient and Intelligent Next uh, systems or rings um, so that uh, the U.S. can maintain a competitive upper hand when it comes to 6G technology. And the reason why I'm noting this is that the ORAN Alliance, uh, for all the good work it's doing, it also has membership of prominent uh, China-based uh, mobile operators, such as China Mobile. And uh, their uh, new uh, 6G initiative is actually being headed by China Mobile. So this is kind of like a hedge, if you will, uh, that right. um, 
while we're still, you know, kicking the tires on 5G, it's not too early to think about 6G more seriously and start, you know, some uh, planning. Uh, but I, I think it's definitely demonstrating, like, there's a lot of variety out there when it comes to the standards bodies and how standardized and inter interoperable open RAN technology is being advanced on, on a global basis. Yeah, absolutely. Exciting stuff for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's 5G today, 6G tomorrow. <laughs> 5G today, 6G tomorrow, and, you know, it's 7G, right? Yeah, uh, right on. So, <laughs> so we're going to shift a little bit and talk still about kind of global adoption of Open RAN 5G, but we're also going to talk about strengthening one's 5G portfolio and the news out of NEC that they were acquiring Aspire Technology was big. Um, Aspire Tech is a Dublin-based company. It provides tech solutions and systems integration specific to designing and integrating open networks. Let's talk about the significance there. Again, as we move toward global adoption of Open RAN 5G, I know you have thoughts on this one. <laughs> yeah, no, that uh, this move uh, leapt out at me because I think it's a really shrewd one by NEC. Uh, right. They really have up their game in terms of uh, their profile across the Open RAN ecosystem specifically, let alone right. the overall uh, 5G market. And so by acquiring Aspire technology, they're definitely locking in valuable systems integration skills to complement their already existing portfolio that extends across different hardware, software assets. And part of the reason why NEC is prominent is that it's been working with uh, major operators such as Telefonica, specifically in Germany, as well as Rakuten, uh, which has definitely been blazing the headlines in terms of advancing open RAN capabilities in commercial Absolutely. networks. And what's interesting is that NEC and Telefonica Germany are already deploying open RAN and VRAN small cells in uh, Munich uh, to kick off Telefonica Germany's own uh, venture into supporting open RAN across commercial networks. And uh, so, yeah, this is really cool because, uh, as I noted, NEC already has in its portfolio disaggregated hardware, software, X Hall, Converge Core, and automation orchestration assets. And that uh, uh, is specifically linked the automation and orchestration assets to its Netcracker subsidiary. So I right. also see the move enhancing uh, Netcracker's ability to play a more significant role in terms of supporting 5G service enablement uh, and uh, also operations enablement and so forth, wherever it's needed. And to kind of wrap this up, um, I think it's noteworthy that, um, uh, as, as you noted, Aspire is headquartered in Dublin, Ireland. So it's right. you know, naturally in Europe. And it's in Europe that you have these major operators, not just Telefonica, but Deutsche Telekom, Orange, Telecom Italia, all rallying behind Open RAN as something that is identified as a strategic imperative. They're even right. looking to enlist the European Commission to support uh, basically an official Open RAN uh, alliance uh, to you know, give it more heft uh, by have political backing in addition to the technological and business backing. So right. uh, stay tuned. Uh, I think this is going to up uh, NEC's hands, particularly in Europe, in terms yeah. of you know, winning more deals uh, further down the line in this uh, important but growing space. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was a really smart move. So we're going to close our show with some news out of T-Mobile, and that is the alliance that T-Mobile for has formed with Oseus. And this alliance is intended to deliver key offerings to the U.S. government, and they're going to start with the Department of Defense, which is always exciting and interesting. So this this uh, alliance was announced a couple of weeks ago, and it will leverage T-Mobile's 5G network and OCS's product offerings and solutions, which are specifically designed for the federal government. Um, this leapt out at me because, you know, the, the DOD is, of course, focused on accelerating 5G adoption as they need to be. And, um, you know, this is all about ensuring that forces can operate anywhere and under any conditions. And so together, T-Mobile and OCS will, will deliver apps that underpin things, AR and VR capabilities, training, active operations and maintenance and logistics. And, you know, as I mentioned, T-Mobile brings its 5G advanced network solutions 
offering, which is a suite of managed network solutions that combine 5G connectivity with edge computing. And this allows for data to be connected, to be collected and processed anywhere it's generated at really rapid speeds. Incredibly important in military situations, right? And Osius brings its expertise in developing tools and technology for delivering access to fast, reliable cellular-based connectivity and mission-critical operations. They'll focus on secure 5G networks, multi-access, edge compute, and sec DevOps. So this is a big step forward for the Department of Defense. I think it's a super smart alliance between T-Mobile and Osius. Really excited to see some of the things that actually we'll never even know about some of the things that come out of this, and that's okay. But I thought it was really kind of exciting news to see. Well, I agree. In fact, yeah, I think it definitely highlights T-Mobile's managed services capabilities. The fact Absolutely. that the uh, Department of Defense is turning to them for this strategically critical capabilities uh, yeah. speaks uh, volumes. And yeah, it's also about the edge computing. I, I think uh, that definitely uh, merits uh, more attention. Uh, basically, it's joined at the hip with 5G connectivity or 5G builds in general, right. particularly in 5G standalone environments. And uh, it's, I think, getting uh, the uh, proper attention here because you obviously have to distribute uh, the data workloads, optimize them where the activity is. You know, you right. just can't keep backhauling them to, uh, to traditional data centers data and so centers, forth. Yeah. And so this definitely is demonstrating why 5G is different from LTE, for example. You get that built-in right. flexibility and agility to uh, do that uh, with uh, 5G programmability uh, capabilities. And I think another uh, key takeaway is, you hit the nail on the head there, Shelley, is the sec DevOps uh, right. aspect. Uh, because uh, as we know, we have to pay attention to security comprehensively. There's no exceptions. Zero trust is the name of the day. Uh, we saw what happened to Solar Winds uh, right. uh, recently. Uh, it was the fact that you actually had a hacker or you know, a, a cyber threat uh, that uh, got into their supply chain capabilities. And Sec DevOps actually addresses that very issue. It's like right. if the software that is being used is being co-developed with built-in security from ground zero, that it definitely improves the odds of it not being compromised even during the development stage or somewhere in the supply chain. And so right. I think that this is uh, definitely uh, addressing it and indicates that yes, you know, the, the good guys, so to speak, are fighting against uh, you know that type of cyber threat, um, and uh, that's quite uh, simply essential. It's particularly yeah. the Department of, of Defense. And uh, one thing I kind of like is that it includes applications, uh, as you noted, like AR, VR. And a lot of the augmented reality, virtual reality uh, attention has been on the consumer side. That stands to reason because, you know, gamers, for example, are uh, making it more uh, commercially uh, viable and uh, a, a low hanging fruit for 5G monetization. But it has a great deal of industrial and Absolutely. also uh, defense applications for things like digital twins, you know, right. maintaining uh, a training, uh, for example, using uh, AR, VR headsets, and a host of other uh, capabilities that make it, uh, I think, uh, very critical to right. a successful uh, defense operation or training and, and so forth. So yeah, I think uh, the announcement, uh, uh, that is high profile as Starlink versus DISH, uh, yeah. definitely uh, is showing some important uh, developments here in our 5G ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. And and to uh, to your point, you know, I, I am positive that the use of AR VR by the Department of Defense is not a nascent thing, right? I'm sure mm -hmm. that this is something that's been in use for a while. We just don't think about it, right, as much as we think about its applications in the gaming ecosystem. Um, but I think really, you know, to wrap this up, I think what's the most interesting thing to me is that seeing T-Mobile's managed services, its 5G advanced network solution offering um, at play here, I think is uh, something that we're going to see, be seeing and hearing a lot more of. So that is really exciting news as well. 
So with that, we are going to wrap this episode of the 5G Factor. Thank you, Ron, as always, for making time to hang out together. And um, thank you to our audience, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on a streaming channel or reading through the transcript on our website. We are always happy to have you and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>